Sorry about that, folks. Okay. Uh, for Tuesday uh, in week two. Okay. So uh, we still want to cover um, from week one lecture, we want to cover the VOC or voice of customer. And I think that this is starting at, let me just check really quick here. This is starting at slide one, number 167. Okay. Um, and uh, then we want to talk about uh, uh, three things today. We're going to talk about SIPOC, um, one of my absolute favorite tools and a, a must-use tool. We're going to talk about DCOM, and I'm going to try and keep this brief. Uh, why? Because like a lot of the stuff that's already been covered, it's very strategic, strategic. How about try strategic, Mark? Strategic. And uh, so I think it'll be helpful to a number of folks in here, but we'll try and make it, uh, we'll try and make it as tactical as we can uh, by asking the question, um, maybe how can you use this in your own project? How might you use it in your own project? But clearly there's other ways that you could use it. You could use it in reviewing a project and so forth. Um, but it's a model, uh, just like a lot of these things are. And then we'll talk about data collection. Okay, and these are all, um, these three right here uh, are all week two. Okay, so that's all week two material. All right, so I, I will feel happy if we get to the end of if we get to the end of data collection, I think we'll probably, my guess is we'll probably have a little bit to go in data collection, but, but uh, that's where I want to be. Um, I have such sort of internal goal to get there. But um, of course, as always, the class is determined by, uh, slart, uh, at least slightly by um, the pace of, um, you know, the questions that you guys ask. So it's your class. Um, all right, now um, one thing I do want to note in passing, we are going to skip um, the third section, section three uh, in week two, uh, which is on crafting uh, metrics. Why are we going to skip this? And the reason is really because um, this is more geared for design and for, a pro and for what do you do if you uh, have a, um, if you're looking at maybe mining projects for an entire area, what are the sorts of things that you're going to look at? And what metrics would you craft? It's actually very helpful, and I'm happy to walk through it, but we're going to be covering this in the, in the last week. We're going to be talking about some of these things. If you do want to, if you read it over, um, and I'll, I'll point out the slide. There's one slide in there that I think is going to be very helpful to you um, if you're, in, if you're, if you need to be looking at a quality program or Six Sigma program or something like that, process improvement program, um, there's one slide that I think will be extremely helpful. And I'll let you know what slide that is when we come to it. Um, but I'm not going to cover all of this section. So I'm just going to point that out in advance. OK, so uh, first thing that we'll do, um, I think, is to, um, is to sort of open up the forum and uh, ask what questions do you have about what we've covered so far? Okay. Um, and I think last time we covered, uh, we covered primarily, we covered the strategic improvement, which was all about strategy maps, right? Which was about relating your project to an overall strategy. We talked about Demaic. Uh, and we talked about some of the, then we started going down the define road. And in particular, we talked about the make business case uh, box, right, in our Demaic roadmap. And by the way, you can open that up and cheat if you want. But in this case, we talked about some of the early stage project management sorts of things, right? What were some of the things that we talked about? What were some of the tools that we talked about in relation to the early stage sort of, I guess I would say project, project related things re related to making the business case. What were some of the things we talked about there? Problem statement. Problem statement. Excellent. Problem statement. And was that Tammy? 
Yeah. Uh, Tammy, so what's a problem statement? Um, like a definition of the, the product or service that you're looking at to make sure everybody is clear on where you're going. Okay. And then it also states like probably measurements. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, so it certainly contains both of those things, a product or service that you're trying to improve, a measurement, but what the problem statement is a statement of what you're going to, of what's wrong, right? Because mm -hmm. the demand process and what we're trying to do, remember it's a problem-based uh, methodology. It's not a solution-based uh, uh, methodology. So we actually do need a problem to solve, <laughs> right? Okay, great, so right. a problem statement. What else? Anybody? Okay. Uh, what does a problem statement go into when you finish it? Charter. Okay, charter. Got it. Great. Awesome. A charter. So, what are some th what are some other things that go into a charter? We talked about how important it is to have a charter. Um, and I'm a big believer in having a one-pager, even if you have a two- or three-pager um, as well. Uh, what are some of the things that go into a charter? We already talked about the problem statement. That's great. The goal. Goal. Okay. Excellent. Um, and the goal could be a turnaround of the problem statement, or it could be separate goals that uh, are related to the problem statement. Good. What else? The scope. The scope. All right, <clears throat> and uh, that was Steve. Um, and yes, I will. How are you? Are you snowed in? Yes, only resolve my technical issues. Oh, okay. All right. Um, um, and wh what are th what are some of the things that you uh, how what are some of the things that you can use to help you determine scope? Well, what's in and what's out. We talked about last time. Mm -hmm. The scope that I'm now done, the focus of the uh, project. Excellent, excellent. You can think of one of the, yeah, you're really asking sort of what's in or what's out. Um, sometimes either of those or both of those questions can be helpful. And you can try and segment. Here are some ideas for segmenting. Um, I might ask um, uh, which process steps are in or out, right? You might ask which products or services. You might ask uh, which customers. What what else? Any other thoughts that you can think of right away? Segmenting or scoping? Um, even the measurements themselves, you may not want to focus on all the different performance metrics for that you know particular problem or process. Love it. Love it. We'll have more to say about that. Uh, today, that's excellent. Right. So, if you're maybe if you have both turnaround time uh, and um, accuracy problems, maybe you say, "Well, we're going to focus on increasing the accuracy, um, and we're going to not forget about turnaround time, but that's not going to be the lever that we're going to try and press." Does that make sense? Okay. Excellent. What else do you put in the charter? What are some other things that you could put in the charter or should put in the charter? Put a list the team. Ah, excellent. Excellent. And what the roles are. And the roles. Excellent. Okay. Objectives or expectations? Hmm. Is that similar to goals? I guess it's not quite the same, but we Oh, yeah. It. Let's just put it like here, goals and objectives, because I think a lot of people um, put those in similar in a similar light. I'm going to erase that right there. Let me add a couple of things. I think a number of you pointed this out. Uh, risks. And this is, these are project risks. Right? Um, uh, timeline sometimes is very important to put in, a basic timeline. When do we want to... You can get into very Six Sigma-ish stuff, like when do we want to finish define, measure, analyze, improve control, or you could give an overall timeline, you know, when essentially do we, you know, do we want to complete this. And then I always like to have at least some sort of business case uh, in there. 
And the business case, of course, is the what, what are the benefits that you get by solving this problem, right? So the business case and the problem statement kind of go hand in hand, business case uh, goal in that. Oops, and one other thing I didn't mention, sometimes very helpful to put metrics in there. You may have them, have them in your uh, problem statement, um, but, you know, kind of toward Steve put in, or what Steve talked about, um, helpful to put those in. I think you can be the judge about what, what things definitely go in or don't, but I would say the things that you really need to make sure that you do go in there are the problem statement, uh, the business case, the team, some sort of statement of the scope, um, and uh, at least one, <laughs> uh, if not two, of the other two. Um, but all of these are fair game and good to put in. Okay, great. Well, if you don't have any other, <clears throat> excuse me, that was my Peter Brady imitation. If you don't have any other uh, uh, questions, I think uh, let's move on to um, what we were going to finish, um, which was the customer focus. Okay, so uh, let's go on to that. Now, in customer focus, I want to talk about um, a few different things. So this, by the way, is in your book. It's in uh, week one. Oops. Go back to the black marker. Week one, um, at starting at 167. Okay, and we're going to talk about a couple of things. One is just the sort of the discussion about um, collecting customer data. Now, um, um, there's a few different methods uh, that we'll talk about here, um, um, but let me just kind of summarize what we're the two main things that we're going to talk about, and then. The second part of this is, okay, so now we have some customer data. What do we do about it? Okay, and there's three tools that we're going to look at. One is called the Kano model. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name, but everybody here in the States uh, says Kano model. Um, uh, so that's one uh, tool. The second tool we're going to look at is a CTQ tree. And the third one we're going to look at very briefly is a VOC matrix. Okay, now these in particular are about creating uh, uh, metrics and, and prioritizing metrics. Now, it's all very interesting, but let's not get too carried away with this because you may already have a very good idea of what you're going to measure um, as your key output variable, the key lever that you're going to push. So, for example, Regina, remind me again what your project is. Mike and I are still determining what it's going to be. Okay, and, and but but the uh, the area what, that we discussed was I'm trying to remember. Do you have uh, a specific area? Right? Either. Um, one of the potentials were related to uh, loan application cycle time from application to funding. Okay, great. So if you choose that and you're already looking at, hey, the problem is the, pro this, the loan applications are taking too long with, the, with respect to the customer um, or with respect to the internal process, um, you may not go through, you may not need to go through this whole rigmarole of understanding a CTQ tree or a VOC matrix in order to come up with, well, we're going to measure the time between when somebody applies for the loan and when that loan is either approved or rejected, they, when they learn about whether it's approved or rejected. Um, so um, um, you may not need that. Um, uh, likewise, I think, Tammy, in your, in your appointment uh, project, um, do you have some sort of uh, you have some sort of idea about what metrics you may or may not use to measure, right? Or you may use to measure. Correct. What what would be a candidate metric that you have? Um, determining. Well, we want to get we have to connect to the mission to the sales force and stuff. I'm sorry, it's breaking up really hard. I'm yeah, that 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 was a little bit better. So so some measurement of of. Uh, of what things are going into Salesforce or what things aren't, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Got it. So, so you could look at a record, an appointment record, and you could determine sort of what are the defects on that record. Correct. Got it. And that gives you some idea of the quality or the accuracy of that. 
and likewise, um, Dan and Steve and John, um, you're measuring, you're, you're working on the optical tables project. What sort of candidate metrics do you have? Well, I, I think uh, a cycle time is um, likely to be one of them, just from a throughput perspective. Yeah, got it. Because you and, and I did profitability to that. Ah, got it. Okay. Yeah, so cycle time and profitability are often related. Um, uh, or touch time is another one of those things that's uh, highly related, right? Because you had said that it's very labor intensive, so maybe you're looking at the amount of time that people touch it um, as opposed to lead time or something like that. Okay. Um, the, other one, the other one that we're trying to sort out is some kind of a customer satisfaction metric. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So um, this, um, this may be helpful to you, uh, that part of the discussion. Um, um, so as we kind of turn through, I don't think I need to go through um, the, a lot of the slides on this, but I do want to talk about, um, uh, let's talk about the first part first. <laughs> Makes sense. So for collecting customer data, um, we've got a few different methods. Uh, one I'm calling, whoops, get it in the right order. Um, so one that I'm calling, actually, let's just, let's just move on, in the, on the next page. So um, in collecting customer data, uh, we've got a few different methods. Um, one uh, is what's called direct. Um, and that would be sort of interview um, focus group. Etc. Okay, something like that. The second method, which is pretty common, is called indirect, and this is a, an example of this would be a survey. Okay. Um, okay. Um, a third type of method would be sort of uh, uh, research, and this could be you know literally market research or consortia that you um, that you uh, that you uh, join I'm not going to spend a lot of time about that and um, uh, a, a fourth type would be um, would be um, uh, uh, I'll just say I'm just gonna whoops I, I forgot one of them in here and that was uh, customer complaints so sometimes you can get some stuff from customer complaints, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Mostly I'll have you talk about it. And I'll just say other, and the main one in other is just an idea that sometimes really works, which is called becoming a customer. Cool. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that. So let's talk about maybe this separately, but I'd like you to spend, um, I think if we look at these examples right here, right, an interview or a focus group, a survey, um, market research, or customer complaints, what I'd like you to do is think about, take 30 seconds and think about, um, you know, what are some advantages and dis what are advantages and disadvantage of any one of these, right? So if we took, if we took, for example, let's do one of them out loud. So take customer complaints. What might be an advantage of customer complaints? Okay. So Showing you areas that you might not have thought of. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Me? Oh. Yeah. Showing you areas that showing you areas that you might not have thought of. You areas you might not have looked at where issues are. Okay. Great. Great. Well, uh, what else? So I think it was maybe Dan. Um, it's an opportunity to ask additional questions, so they might give a very generic. I I had a hard time uh, with the representative. Okay, so let's talk more about that. Just asking more open-ended questions to get to the root of it versus a survey where they could uh, do a comment. <coughs> enter a comment like that and you really wouldn't know what the issue was. Okay, so a customer complaint might be, it gives you an idea of, of uh, who uh, to interview, right? And what the follow-ups might be. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yes. 
Okay, of whom is it to interview <laughs> and, and follow-ups? Okay, great. Was there somebody else? Uh, yeah, okay, I wanted uh, my comment with the, with the customer complaint. It sounds typically has to do with a specific case. So, and there might be some you know, clear data or to analyze or to to review. Yes. So it can often be very specific. It can point you directly to the problem, whereas sort of uh, sometimes a vague uh, survey might not get you there, right? might say, well, it's not so easy to deal, it's, your product is not so easy to use, is very different than saying, you know, every time I click into, I go all the way down into this submenu, I have to go all the way back up in order to uh, re-enter uh, a certain parameter. Well, that's helpful. What are some disadvantages? What's the disadvantage of customer complaints? Of customer complaints? It comes too late. It comes too late. Okay. What else? You only hear about the really bad stuff. That's right. You only hear about the really True. bad stuff. It's <laughs> yeah. that's right. So the only people who complain are the are the squeaky wheels, right? So what about the other customers who are marginally satisfied, or maybe aren't satisfied but just don't speak up? So right. Yeah. So uh, now in my business case, uh, I find some uh, also it, the information can have a likelihood of getting filtered. By the time it goes and enter the entered in a database. Okay. Okay. So it's not it's not direct. Somebody has scrubbed it. Right. Okay. Got it. So so there's all sorts of things, and I think that the 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 important thing, all methods, all data collection, um, has inherent positives and inherent inherent negatives with it. Okay. All of it does. There are advantages and there are disadvantages. So I'd like you to take a little bit of time and think about. Um, these things, an interview, a survey, and market research. And what might be some advantages, might, might be some di disadvantages. Just take 30 seconds of sort of silent thought, and jot down uh, one or two things, and, and then we can uh, have a bit of a discussion. While you do that, I'm going to open up a uh, PowerPoint here. <clears throat> okay, um, I think you probably have a couple of uh, quick things that come to mind of this. Uh, let's talk about direct um, methods, interview or focus group. What's an advantage of, uh, of a direct method? John, did you come up with one? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the questions by its nature, is, it's more direct. So as you're talking to them, you can uh, adjust and adapt the questions and uh, and delve deeper. If it's indirect, you know, for a set, you know, for example, if the questions are already set up and sure, you know, you you know, so you can't. So if it goes a different way, you're not able to adapt. Whereas with a direct, you are. Excellent. So it's it's flexible, um, and uh, it's flexible, and uh, and uh, a skilled interviewer can go uh, in and, and get a lot of uh, data that you normally wouldn't in the other. Okay, any other advantages? I think it's going to lead to like a frank conversation. Um, in, instead of uh, sometimes you get complaint, you feel like you're getting somebody venting versus uh, if you do a direct um, interview, it's more conversational and you know, you can, which, you know, which you can get more, you know, more, more level headed um, responses and complaints. Got it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So there's a richness of the information that you get back. Okay, what are maybe a couple of uh, disadvantages of, uh, of interviewing? The person you're interviewing might not feel comfortable telling you everything face-to-face. -face. Yeah, so uh, excellent. So, and in fact, there can even be interviewer bias, right? If I ask the question mm -hmm. in a harsh way, I might upset you and you might give me zero information. Or there could be things where um, I ask you questions where, um, um, uh, let's suppose, I mean, I, 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 a few of you have seen me, but um, 
uh, if I ask you a question, I have very short hair, for example, and I also wear glasses. So if I ask somebody, how do you feel about people who wear glasses, you might be inclined to say, oh, I, I like them, or I don't mind them, even if you did really dislike people who wear glasses. All right, so that was a good example, but um, I think you get the point. Um, additionally, what if uh, you have to be really careful who else is around. If, um, if uh, somebody asked me, say my doctor or something asked me about my diet and my wife is in the room, I might give a different answer than if she wasn't. Um, so um, you have to be a little bit careful on that. Okay, great. Um, how about surveys or indirect methods? What are some advantages of, uh, of surveys? It's cheap. It's uh, cheap uh, per it's cheap per, uh, per sample, right? Yeah. We didn't talk about that, but the cost is very high with uh, interviews. You know, it, it relatively high. Uh huh. Excellent. What else? Uh, it may allow you to standardize the survey questions uh, versus if you do a direct where you may have it, you know, where it's flexible, you may be adapting, you may not get a true, if you want to compare, you know, one, one customer versus the other, mm -hmm. it may not be um, easy to do that. Right, right, but right. But the indirect method is more standardized. Uh, that's right. It's it's uh, it's easier to keep standardized. I'll put it that way. Whenever I do interviews, yeah. I certainly have a list of questions, and I tested those questions beforehand, and I want to go through them. But very often, I want to go into, I, I want to delve more deeply uh, in with one person and with another, um, and I want to adapt. So yeah. So because of that, it's also easier to analyze um, the data coming from an indirect uh, method. Uh, very often people put it on a, uh, earlier you mentioned customer satisfaction. Um, there's lots of different scores that people have uh, coming from customer satisfaction or customer satisfaction-like things. Uh, everything from net promoter score to uh, loyalty metrics to uh, straight-ahead straight satisfaction, uh, seven-point or five-point scale. Um, so what are some bad things or what are some uh, things that you got to watch out for in a survey? I think the survey you have that test of the plate problem where you might just hear something wrong. Uh huh. Right. So um, I guess I would the way that I would put it is you only get answers to what you ask for. <laughs> um, right? right. So if I ask a question, if I'm own a hotel and I ask a question, uh, you know, was the mint uh, was the mint tasty? You're going to tell me whether the mint was tasty, but you're probably not going to tell me about the pillows or the bed or the cleanliness of the room. So. Okay, good. And uh, you also have to watch the questions, right? Um, so if you ask a, a difficult question or a charged question, um, you'll get an answer that uh, you may not uh, that you may not expect. So watch the wording of the questions. Again, I, I would I would say test it out. Um, and then uh, uh, research has some advantages as well. Um, you can sometimes get data that you wouldn't normally get. Um, but some of the minuses are it can be expensive, and it can be difficult to make those comparisons, right? Because one consortium might have different metrics than another. Um, if you have a, a, a kid in college or you're thinking about that, you know that comparing colleges, um, even looking at what the total cost is going to be, is a difficult thing to do. Because some people include, um, you know, out-of-pocket expenses for for uh, for living expenses. Some don't. Uh, anyway, there's all sorts of things that are that are done really as uh, as sales tools for the universities, not for the consumer. Um, all right, so um, I just did want to mention I, I, we're going to move on, I think, but I did want to mention in passing this idea of becoming a customer. Now, this is something that can be now, admittedly, on the optical table one, that's probably a difficult one, but on many services it is not so hard to actually set up an account and try and push it through and uh, see what happens. So on the loan application, that might work. On an appointment, um, something like that might work. Um, and it often really shows you um, um, what was, a, you know, Bill Clinton's line as president was always, I feel your pain, right? So <laughs> if you actually go through the process, um, you can feel the pain. Um, 
So that's often very good, um, a very good thing to do. Um, if you're a, um, I remember once a, um, uh, a um, uh, when we were working with an oncology lab, uh, we had somebody go in and, and um, uh, do the whole waiting in line thing uh, for their laboratory. Um, they actually didn't, didn't have to sit in the chemo chair, obviously, but um, they still got much of that experience. Um, and it was, it was horrifying, you know, I mean, it, it took a long time to, to check them in and then they waited forever at their lab and, um, and all that. So, um, anyway, that can be helpful. Uh, I, I think it also though, I talk about bias. I mean, that's a, that's a sample of one or two or three or four. So you're not getting the full thing and you shouldn't confuse yourself that you are, but sometimes real data like that's very helpful. Okay, I'm going to go on. We've obviously just scratched the surface of all of this stuff. Um, and uh, I would advise you that if you do have a project which is very externally focused, um, that um, uh, we utilize some time on the Friday or some time that we set up to kind of talk through uh, what, how you ought to look at that customer data, how you ought to collect it, and so forth. Um, um, so. Uh, I'm going to move on, um, but um, uh, definitely want to uh, give you the opportunity to, to reach out if you need to. Okay, so let's pick it up on, um, let's pick up the rest of our discussion on slide um, 179. Uh, 179. Oops, hello. There we go. And we're going to talk about the Kano model, the CTQ tree, and the VOC matrix. So these are really techniques to help you develop focused metrics. And as we already saw, a couple of people already have them, so um, we're not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on this. Um, the first one I wanted to talk to you about is really a model, and it's a picture model. Um, and I find that it helps to build it um, together. So, so let's, uh, let's start. Uh, from the start. Now, this was uh, developed by a guy uh, uh, named Noriaki Kino, or Kama, um, and um, and uh, he envisioned essentially two that that customers are satisfied. When we look at customer satisfaction, uh, we essentially have two things that we're looking at. Um, one is the quality of the product that we deliver, and that is given by this. This, uh, as we increase from left to right. That's the quality of the product, right? So I've got it written there, uh, but that's the left to right. Okay, so over here we've got high quality. And on the left-hand side, we've got low quality. And uh, on the y-axis, or the vertical, is the amount of satisfaction that the customer has when you fulfill something. And on the top, we've got a satisfied customer and on the bottom, we've got unsatisfied customers. Now, <clears throat> what's different about this, uh, that, that all should make sense. The higher quality we produce, the higher uh, we would expect um, the satisfaction to be. But Kino uh, envisioned that there are essentially, there are different things that customers care about. Um, and some things, uh, you can't really play the satisfaction game with them. You just have to have them. So <coughs> he envisioned three things. One are must-haves, uh, one was satisfiers, and one was delighters. So let's talk through, um, uh, and forget about the competitive pressure thing for just a moment. I'll get to that in a second. But let me give you an example for this so we can kind of latch on to it um, and, and see how it works. So uh, let's talk about a hotel. So for a hotel, uh, if I check into a hotel, um, what are some things that are must-haves? A must-have thing at a hotel would be clean room. Mm -hmm. Okay. A must-have uh, thing at a hotel would be towels. A must-have at a at a hotel would be a bed. All this making sense? <laughs> uh, if, yeah. I if I don't have these things, and here's the point: if if I have these things. I, look, if I go into the bathroom and I see that there, let, you know, let, uh, if I go into the bathroom and I see that there's uh, five rolls of toilet paper, I'm not going to go, oh my God, this is great. 
kids, let's call grandma. Um, no, I'm just going to kind of say, okay, well, I guess the room has toilet paper. But if there's not toilet paper, I'm going to notice, right? So if it's a bit not clean, I notice it. But I don't really even, it's not one of those things that is really noticed if, if it's there. Um, so what would be something, how about for a car? What would be something that would be a must-have for a car? Headlights. Headlights, right. Okay. I'm going to notice if it doesn't have, if the headlights aren't working, right? Or if it only has three tires. Now, that's, you know, that's way off on the scale. But it's off, the point is, it's really often, when you ask customers how satisfied they are, they don't even tell you about must-haves because, <clears throat> because they're assuming that they're going to be there. Okay. The second thing that he, that he talked about were called satisfiers. So those were must-haves. The second things they had uh, that he talked about were satisfiers. Oh, and I'm sorry, before I move on, you see the trajectory of must-haves. I'm never going to get a satisfied customer by delivering just must-haves. I can get somebody who's marginally okay, but if I screw up at all, I get an unsatisfied customer. Okay, so that was the trajectory that he envisioned there. Okay. Second thing was satisfiers. So uh, uh, if I think about satisfiers for a hotel, it would be um, maybe a quick check-in, a fast check-in, a fast check-out, um, an extremely clean room, uh, a room with uh, the number of amenities that I get, right? So those would be things that uh, some people used to call them more is better. Um, but of course, if you're talking about cycle time, less is better. <laughs> um, but um, things like uh, in a car, what, what would be a satisfier in a car? Air conditioner, I guess. <laughs> What's that? Air condition, maybe? And I said the same thing, yeah. Okay, so we'll say air condition, AC, and uh, I'll, I'm going to leave that to the end of the discussion. Uh, but that's good. That's good. How about uh, how about speed zero to sixty speed, right? So if it's even faster going, for, if you're a sports car fan, which I'm actually not, but if you're a sports car fan, if you go faster zero to sixty, that's actually sa going to satisfy me uh, more and more and more, depending on you know how fast that can go. Does that make sense? Okay. Things like, you know, a number of amenities that you've got or number of uh, add-on things. Power, everything has power steering now and all that. Those would be satisfiers. Okay. And then delighters are things usually that the customers haven't even thought of. But when they appear in the marketplace, the customers can't do without them. So, years and years ago, before cars had AC, the first car that had a working AC, and it was great, um, I'm sure that somebody driving in Florida or Texas said, man, this is the best thing uh, since proverbial sliced bread. And uh, if they didn't even think of it beforehand, that would have been a delighter to them. Um, now, it's interesting, you know, computer industry tries delighters all the time and they miss the mark. Um, um, uh, so you never really know whether something's going to be a delighter until you get it out there. Uh, we're going to focus on the must-haves and satisfiers. And I'm going to show you how you can use this to focus on what we ought to do with this particular product. Um, the prioritization is obviously must-haves come first, then satisfiers, uh, and then delighters. And whoops, I didn't, I didn't say this thing about competitive pressure. I'm going to say about it now. The point of this is that, yeah, 40 years ago, AC may have been a satisfier or even a delighter, but for most people today, it's a must-have. Um, um, for those of you who live in the Northeast, I'm one of you. Um, uh, we used to have heated, uh, I have heated seats. Um, that used to be a delighter for me. Now it's a must have. Uh, um, so uh, definitely one of those things that I need to have, especially this time of year. Okay, so, um, so the way that you would actually uh, work this and this would be, um, if you were going to facilitate this, um, uh, the way that you would actually work it is you would start by drawing up uh, this grid. And then you would scribe your customer needs uh, from customer data or brainstorming. Uh, and maybe we'll do this in just a second. Um, 
And, um, and then what you want to do is you want to kind of segment them into must-haves and satisfiers and delighters. And then you'll draw this on a flip chart. And you can place the sticky notes, sticky notes, quote, where you feel they should go. So notice that we're not using a lot of data here. Uh, we could use some data from a customer survey, or we could just use something, we could just use, you know, uh, wisdom of the organization. But the idea is you put things on there where you think they should go. You start with putting on, say, the must-haves, <clears throat> and then you put on the satisfiers, and then you put on the delighters. Usually the, this is about it. You know, you have more satisfiers and must-haves than you would the, the delighters. And the idea would be that if you, um, if you, you find that you could prioritize, um, uh, you should, if you're thinking about running a project um, to improve these things, it makes an awful lot of sense. That's, that's the idea. That's the general idea. So, so if we, whoops, I already circled it. <laughs> Look at that. Okay. So before we go on, let's just see if we can, um, if we can maybe quickly uh, take a look at working this. Um, like, um, I don't know how many of you go to Starbucks, but if you had, uh, if we were looking at getting, uh, if we were looking at um, getting coffee at Starbucks, what would be some of the satisfiers? Um, what would be some satisfiers that we had? Or, or what would be some either, what would be some things that you, what would be some needs that you have if you go and order coffee at Starbucks? The coffee's hot. Hot coffee. Okay, got it. What else? Prepared like fast. Fast service. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. What else? Wi-Fi service? What's that? Wi-Fi, I guess. Wi-Fi? Okay, got it. Great. I think that's great. And uh, let's see. What else? I like it to be clean. I like uh, friendly staff. A friendly. Excellent. You took the words out of my mouth. I was going to use the word courteous. <laughs> Okay, and I, I probably care about cost. I care about atmosphere. Okay, so <clears throat> the idea would be, um, just to do this pretty quickly, if we've got satisfiers, let's see if I can draw the, the lines appropriately. We've got uh, must-haves. There's my must-haves, and let's just stick to those, right? I mean. The delighters would be things like, you know, free coffee Tuesday or who knows what, right? We don't even know. But let's just stick to these guys right here. Um, I, uh, let's see. Um, uh, I need the coffee to be, um, let's try this one. Um, uh, what would you say in terms of uh, must-haves or, or satisfiers? I would say that this is probably a... Uh, uh, well, I don't know. I'll I'll let you, I'll let you be the judge. Must haves, satisfy. Most of the must have. I think that's must a have. as well. Okay. This we're going to put as a satisfier, and the reason why mm -hmm. is we're going to is because the faster it is, the more it's going to satisfy me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. How about Wi-Fi? Probably a satisfier. I think it's a satisfier. Okay. How about clean? Must have. Uh, how about friendly? Satisfier. I would agree. <clears throat> uh, how about cost? Satisfier. <laughs> or dissatisfier, but whatever, yeah. And how about atmosphere? Well, I'll put my, this was mine, so I'll put that as a satisfier. And you can think of this as noise or as comfy couches or whatever, right? Okay, and now the easy thing, or the thing to do would be, like if you had the Starbucks, 
uh, it would be easy to rate this for your Starbucks, or it would be easy for you or for your customers to say where these different things went. Um, for us, we're going to have to imagine going into a Starbucks and uh, uh, getting service on it. Um, but if we if we did, you know, where would uh, getting hot coffee be? Um, just to throw this out, I think that most of the time when I go into Starbucks, they don't have a problem giving me hot coffee. They're pretty good at it. So since they're pretty good at it, that's where that would go. Does that make sense to folks? Yep. Okay. How about clean? Where would you put the Starbucks on clean? This would be super clean. This would be this would be this would be very dirty. Just over the midline. Just over the uh, about right here. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so again, it doesn't matter. There's obviously no exact, and when you have more of these. Um, you get an idea of how to spread these things out. Remember, this is sort of a relative. Um, this is sort of a relative thing, um, and we could do the same thing with. I think you get the gist of this. Um, you could do the same thing with the with the satisfiers. Um, you know, the atmosphere is usually in my. I'm just going to put my opinion up here, okay, guys. Uh, atmospheres in Starbucks. Uh, usually okay. Uh, friendly is usually somewhere down here, I think, uh, right along with price. Um, clean usually seems pretty reasonable. And uh, fast, I don't know, about middle of the road. So this would give you at least some idea about, you know, if, cust if, if you wanted to satisfy customers more, you know, what you might want to focus on. Uh, uh, on this. And of course the idea is you focus on the things that you're not doing well, not the things that you focus on doing well. Um, this isn't a be-all and end-all analysis, but it's helpful to kind of give a picture because then when others look at it, it can be communicated pretty quickly as, yeah, these are the things that we're going to go after because these are the things that we don't satisfy the customer needs very well on. And we can do it a lot better. That's the whole idea of the Kino model. Okay, what questions do you have on the Kino model? We're good? So, so just to get this right, on the Kino model, yep. you, you pick, I guess, a topic, for lack of a better word, right. and then brainstorm what the most have and the, uh, you know, the satisfiers and the delighters are, and then place them. There's an actual uh, perceive. Uh, that's right. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. That's exactly right. And if you use sticky notes, um, if you use sticky notes, you can do it uh, pretty quickly and directly onto a, onto a, uh, onto a flip chart or onto some onto a virtual flip chart, which is, I think, something that we can actually do. Uh, we're going to do today, but we won't do it in in Kano. All right. Excellent. Um, so Kano's can sometimes be pretty useful. Um, uh, another thing, uh, so another thing that can actually get you kind of to the down to the nitty gritty of actually developing a metric is a CTQ tree. Um, so, um, all right. So you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna take a moment here. Uh, we're gonna talk about VOC metric uh, matrix, but I want to um, I want to point out one slide to you and one specific part of a slide as we go to this. So if you turn to if you turn to slide 186, I want you to mark this or something like this. Here is a way that I have found that uh, is very effective at brainstorming um, the oops at brainstorming um, and finding sort of customer <clears throat> customer needs, whatever those are, whether they're Kino analysis uh, things that you put on the must-have satisfiers or, or delighters. Or there are other things, um, and it's exactly this: you ask a specific question, and the specific question is a a high quality blank is one that is blank. And so, um, for the optical table project, you'd say a high quality optical table is one that is. Um, or if it's a transaction like the appointment, a high quality appointment is one that is blank. And if you ask 
And it's important to ask the word is, because if you ask the word has, you get features. If you ask the word is, you get characteristics, and that's kind of what you want. So, um, for example, uh, a high quality, um, uh, if we're talking about just the coffee at Starbucks, and I ask the question, a high quality cup of coffee is one that is blank, you would give me answers like what? What would be one, what would be a fill in the blank? Hot, taste good. Hot, tasty. What else? A high quality cup of coffee is one that is Oh boy, okay, timely, etc. okay? So um, if you ask these about most products um, or most business products, you very often get similar sorts of answers and um, you get, um, um, and, and some of those answers are, um, uh, 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 some of those answers are things like, uh, uh, well, let me just, let me just, um, what if we took, um, what if you took a real business product? We've been talking about uh, cups of coffee, but let's take a real business product, like, um, I don't know, an invoice, okay? A customer invoice. And believe me, we're going to get to CTQ tree in just a second because this is related, okay? So if I took a, a customer invoice and I said a high, a high, how about a highly satisfactory? We'll change this word in just a little bit little bit, a highly satisfactory uh, invoice is one that is, is one that is, and I ran out of room there, blank, okay? What would be some of the adjectives that you would put in there? A highly satisfactory invoice is one that is blank. Easy to read. Easy to read, excellent. What else? Itemized. Itemized, okay. What else? Accurate. Accurate, love it. What else? Timely. Timely, love it. What else? How about complete? Mm -hmm. How about concise? Okay. <clears throat> Point I wanted to put in here, and, and, and by the way, you can put in some, you can try uh, other types of services or products, and um, you find that a lot of times you get these sorts of uh, very similar answers. These are, this one is, uh, if you change the word read to use, you get one that you get that almost every time. Accurate is another one that you get. Timely is another another one that you get. Complete is another one that you get often. Um, reliable. If you talk about these are service products. If you talk about uh, real products, you also get things like reliable, safe, um, uh, stylish. Sometimes if you're talking about a car or something like that. Um, so those are some of the those are some of the things that you're going to get often, um, but just remember this question because if you if you put the word is there, you start to get real characteristics, and then you can break down those characteristics into things that you can measure, um, pretty easy. But if you start with has, you start to get you, you ask directly about the features, and it can lead you down a certain path, um, um, maybe too quickly. All right. Uh, now, I'm, I'm emphasizing this a, tr a tremendous amount, um, and the reality is um, in a design project, this is super important. In a Six Sigma improvement project, a lot of times we can just move on to metrics pretty quickly, and as long as we're thinking about these customer characteristics that we care about right, in our product, and we find something like, oh yeah, if we're measuring defect rates, that's getting us toward 
um, that's getting us toward this accuracy thing, and customers want our product to be accurate. Um, if we look at on-time deliveries, yeah, that's dealing with the timely one, and we're good with that. Customers really care about that. If we want, if we're looking at sort of the number of uh, the, the number of phone transfers um, that a customer has uh, when they typically call, the average number of uh, phone transfers, we're getting at you know how easy is our call is our call center product uh, to use for the customer. Okay, so if we start from there, is this making some sense, guys? Hope so. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Um, so um, if we start from there, now let's talk about the CTQ uh, tree. And uh, by the way, you could have we could have done this with the Kano example as well, and uh, that would have been a good one to put our stickies on. Uh, if we start with a customer uh, CTQ tree, what a CTQ tree does is it just starts with that customer characteristic. Notice that's not a measurement yet, and we just kind of ask the questions until we get a measurement. We say things like, well, what would, uh, how would I know this particular invoice is easy to, is easy to understand? And um, I might uh, go, as, as, uh, as Regina said, I might say, well, it's, it's easy to read, which I didn't put on here, but, um, um, or I might say it fits on one page, and that might already be a measurement for us, so we could stop there. I can tell whether it's easy to uh, understand because it fits on one page. I'm not saying it's a good measurement, I'm saying it could be. Um, how about accuracy? Well, I know if something's accurate if the calculations are correct, or if very few items are estimated, or if blah, blah, blah. And you can keep kind of drilling down into that until you get a, uh, until you get an, an answer. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, so that's why it's called a tree is because there's lots of different branches to it. The idea is you don't have to take all of these, but if you're trying to develop something that's accurate, make sure that you have something that on the bottom is measurable. Um, like I can say how many items are estimated. I can count that, right? So that can tell me something about the accuracy. I can, I can actually check to see whether the calculations are all correct um, and measure that. So that's something I can actually measure for accuracy. Okay? So that's what a CTQ tree is. Um, I think since we're, where we are in the time, uh, we're a little bit behind on this. I think what I'm going to do is I am going to move past the VOC matrix, which is something that is a wonderful tool for a design project, but uh, we're going to be covering lots of different matri metrics, matrix methods, um, and I'm just going to go quickly through uh, the way that this works. Um, if you don't get it, I uh, would encourage you to, to, to uh, call up on the Friday and I go walk you through an example. We're just gonna we're just gonna walk through the example that's in the slides, uh, starting at slide 86. Uh, just like or 186, just like in the previous one, we're gonna start with the developing the customer characteristics. That is, what are the things that the customers care about? Like easy use, timely, accurate, concise, complete, relevant, um, things like that. Um, and we do that by asking a quality blank is one that is blank. Okay. All right. Um, we would start by putting those VOC accurate uh, VOC attributes over here. So this could be timely or whatever. Here I've got putting the it's a service of putting new tires on my car, and these are the various attributes that people had. Okay. So you start by putting in the VOC attributes and what the service is, and what we're going to do is we're going to relate these on the left hand side, the VOC attributes, to our measurements that we could make and we're going to score them and prioritize them. So again, I'm going to go quickly through this, and um, hopefully it'll make some sense, and if not, um, you can ask me a question now, or I can go you through an example in, um, in a, uh, in, uh, uh, with you one-on-one. -on, -one. Um, on the top then, uh, once you've got the VOC attributes put in, you put in for the team the, num the proposed measurements. For example, the percentage of first-time appointment requests that we accept, or hours between drop-off and pickup. Okay, for if I'm putting new tires in a car, um, that might be something that I could measure if I were the auto auto repair shop. I could also measure how long a customer waits in my shop. 
Okay? And then what we want to do is we want to mark a cell either yes or no if the two items relate to each other. So for example, let me, uh, let me highlight one right here. So let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at uh, this one right here. Okay, so this cell is the intersection of the customer wait time in the shop and the, com and is this in, and the customer wants it completed quickly. Does the customer wait time in the shop relate to whether we complete the job quickly? The answer is yes, I believe. The most people would agree that this is a, that this is a good measurement or it's certainly directly related to this particular VOC attribute. So if I measure the customer wait time in the shop, it will give me some idea about whether we complete something quickly. So that gets a yes. Whereas right here, it gets a no, because if I look at how long the customer waits in the shop, is that an indication of whether we have completely explained uh, the service to them or clearly explained the service to them? Um, you should only put in things where the, that where you, the entire team feels that it's directly related, um, and those all get yeses. And the ones that are not related get no's. And um, that's basically it for the tool. It's a pretty straightforward tool. At the end, you can simply count all the yeses. And this is a very simple matrix. And basically, it gives you the, the better candidates for the ones that um, take care of more VOC attributes than others. So it's just a way of bringing clarity in terms of what things uh, are measured. The other thing I will point out is it also tells you if you if there are attributes that you don't have any measurement, look at this. These rows right here show that there are no measurements that are related to those quality attributes. So if we care about the clarity of the uh, of the bill and how courteous we are, we're not measuring anything with respect to that. Okay, so so VOC matrix kind of puts everything on a page, which is helpful, uh, which is pretty helpful. Okay, so pretty straightforward tool, I think. Um, but again, it's there's a lot of moving parts. There's the left hand side, there's the top, which are the attributes. Uh, there are the proposed measurements, and there's the how they're related to each other, and the score. Okay, and the score is just the sum of the yeses. This one has seven yeses. This one has six. There's no weights between the attributes. Okay. Um, so we're going to get this as a, as a homework. But uh, now I want you to take, uh, and we're going to get that one as well. I want you to take uh, a minute and write down in your views what are the key takeaways of this section that we covered. Remember, it's a, it's a vast subject. Um, we just scratched the surface. We talked about how to collect data, what some of the advantages and disadvantages were. And then we talked about three tools. We talked about Kano analysis. We talked about um, we talked about a CTQ tree very briefly, and then we talked about the VOC matrix very briefly. Um, so take a minute um, to write down what are the, what are the key takeaways of this section, and then we will go into uh, week two SIPOC.
Okay. So let's start again on this. Uh, on, uh, we're going to go into week two. Uh, slide. We're going to start in slide uh, two and go through 16. We're going to talk about the SciFoc. Uh, we're going to talk about the SciFoc tool. Um, now, for, uh, for those of you who, who, who have covered this before, who know what a SciFoc is, um, that's great. Um, but, and for those of you who don't, um, I think I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it out there. SciFoc is one of those things that, um, um, is extremely valuable to a team to do. The artifact is sometimes helpful, um, but, uh, it's definitely helpful to build the artifact. Okay. And, and, um, I want to put this in perspective, um, um, if we turn to slide four, um, which is our DMAIC roadmap, here's where we are right here. We're talking about building the macro map. We just talked about linking to the customer. We talked about the business case. Now, if we look at sort of those three pillars, um, remember Six Sigma is about making life better for the, for the business, making life better for the customer, and the, <laughs> method, and the, methods, that we, and the methods that we use are process methods. Um, so we're using process methods to make things better for the customer and for the business. The SIPOC is the first time we start to bring in the process into all of this picture, right? So it's really important in terms of making the rubber hit the road. Okay, there's all sorts of things. Instead of going through the slides, what I thought I'd do is let's do an example of one together and that'll help you understand sort of how something gets built and uh, what some of the advantages are and we can kind of talk uh, about uh, what those are um, as we're doing it rather than going through slides. I think that that will probably be more helpful. Um, and I also want to show you something because I know at least one of the, uh, well I know at least two of the companies have lots of different branches all over so uh, one of the modern problems of a black belt is dealing with the fact that you can't get everybody in the same physical room uh, very often. So let's do one um, virtual. Uh, we're going to do a virtual, excuse me, we're going to do a virtual SIPOC. So um, uh, like I said, a SIPOC, oh, let, me, let me just actually, sh you know, I'll tell you what, I am going to do one slide. I don't know where my slides went. There they are. I'm going to give you one slide and show you what it looks like. Here's what a process, here's what a SIPOC looks like. First of all, it's an acronym. Uh, it's an acronym for suppliers, inputs, process, outputs, customers. Okay? S I P O C. Okay? So it's a relationship map that helps you understand all sorts of things. It helps you relate your process. That is what you do, right? What you do um, to the customers. This is who you do it for and uh, how you measure what you do, right? What do you produce? And on the input side, it says, what are the things that you need to make this process go and uh, who supplies those things? So it's a relationship uh, map that helps you understand all the things that you need to know about the process and whether or not and how it aligns with the customers. Very helpful, very helpful in that regard. Okay, so <clears throat> so that's what a SIPOC is. Um, let's let's go ahead and let's build one. Um, like I said, let's build one for um, for a certain process. And the process that I'm going to suggest that we build one for is the process of, um, <laughs> that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, is the process of uh, putting, uh, putting gas in your car. Okay, so for this I'd like you to, uh, we're going to actually facilitate and do an actual SIPOC in here, the SIPOC for that. The way that I do a SIPOC is I start with the P. Okay, so we're going to start from the process. By the way, at, at GE, they have you start from the C, uh, which has some good, at least theoretical sense, but I found that starting from the P is the most helpful. 
uh, or that that it produces the best results. So let's start with uh, let's start with this. And what I'd like you to do is you tell me what the first step is. So take take 15 seconds and write down the first step of that process. Okay. Oops, that was not supposed to happen. Okay, what's the first step of the process? Arrive at the gas station. Um, okay, yeah, uh, I'll pull you in just a second. <laughs> okay, does everybody have one written down? All right. Um, okay, so now let's go through. So uh, let's see. So, so Dan, what was your first step? To arrive at the gas station. Arrive at gas station. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, Regina, what did you have as the first step? Mine was very similar. My first step said drive to gas station. Drive to gas station. Okay, great. Uh, now, does drive? Now I'm going to be a little bit facetious here. Does driving to the gas station happen before you arrive there or afterward? It, it happens before, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this isn't rocket science, guys. That's okay. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. How about Steve? What did you have? Uh, figure out the payment method. Figure out payment method. You sure you're not in accounting? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right. Uh, that's an interesting one. I'm going to leave it over there for just now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, uh, Tammy? Mine was pull up to the gas pump. Okay, and uh, and John. I also had drive to pump. Drive to pump. Okay. Okay, got it. So uh, it seems to me that uh, if we if we sort of arrange these in in you know what happens first sort of methods, um, that we get something that looks a bit like this. Uh, pulling up to the gas station happens a little bit after you arrive at the at the gas station. Drive to pump is kind of a catch-all, isn't it? So it's almost like this. Would you agree? And then the figure yeah. out the the payment method. Who knows when that happens, right? That may be somewhere up here, or maybe somewhere else. But but let's just leave it um, in here for just a moment. Um, and Steve, you've produced a something which is uh, difficult to handle. Um, because <laughs> Sorry. yeah, that's okay. It sometimes happens this way. Uh, this is just something. Um, this is just something that um, you often have, um, where we'll make these in scope or out of scope um, decision afterward. The point I want to drive home is this is something really, really simple, right? And yet, um, we may have. When I ask a class of thirty people to do this, um, they'll have things like. Um, in here, like um, uh, map out, uh, uh, decide I need gas. Well, okay, great. Um, you know, and the question is, does that happen before you drive to the gas station or not? Well, it happens before. And and here's the thing, you know, you as a team now get to decide whether that's <laughs> you have a picture of whether that's going to be in scope or out of scope, right? So this helps bring the team together on. Oh, what are the things that really, what is the essence of what really happens in this process? What's in scope and what's out of scope? Okay, so um, let's just say for the moment, okay, um, I wouldn't necessarily do this so easily in a, in a real, um, if I were really facilitating this, but let's just say for the moment that deciding I need gas, that's out of scope. Uh, uh, the whole driving there, that's out of scope. Uh, and driving to the gas station. Let's just start with arriving at the gas station. This is everything that happens when we arrive at the gas station, right? So uh, whether we pull up afterward, that's, uh, that's there. 
I'm going to leave these two over here for a moment. Um, and for the folks that I just eliminated your stickies, I'm, I normally would not do that so quickly. I apologize. Okay, now let's do the same game. And, and it's going to help if you write it down with a pencil because then you, you'll have it exactly. Let's do the, let's do the last step. How do, you know when this, how do you know when this process ends? Now that we've defined the beginning, how do we know when the process is over? What's the last step of this process? I'm going to make some sticky notes, pre-make them. Okay, hopefully you've got it done. Um, let me go in a bit of a different order. Steve, what was the last step in this process? To drive away. Drive away. Okay. Um, let's see. John? I have drive away as well. Drive away. Okay. Uh, let's see. Tammy? Leave the gas station. Uh, Regina? Uh, get a receipt. Oh, okay. Or print out the receipt. Uh -huh. Got it. Um, and uh, Regina? Um, swipe discount card. Or rewards card. Yep, got it. Okay, excellent. We would ask the same sort of questions, right? Do you get a receipt? Be getting a receipt, does that happen before or after you drive away? Okay, that's pretty obvious. How about the swiping the discount card? Does that happen before or after you get a receipt? Anyway, the idea is to just get a bound on what's going on, okay? And let's just, for practical purposes, let's get, um, let's put in um, drive away as the last step. Uh, Tammy, would you agree that leave the gas station is the same as drive away? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to delete that and delete this duplicate. And um, great. And so now uh, what we've got is we've got the beginning and the end of the process. Um, okay. And what we can do, oops, I'm going to put this under my P now. Oh. Okay. We've got the beginning and the end of the process. And uh, what we can do now is we can start to fill in some of the, the rest of the story, so to speak. I'm just going to delete the, that stuff right now. And uh, so that's my P. I've got the beginning and the end. Let's now talk about, uh, let's now move this direction. Um, um, okay, so let's now move this direction. And uh, let's talk about what are some of the outputs. So unlike these right here, which are verbs, these are verbs, right, or verb-noun combinations, um, um, what are some of the outputs that we would have from this? Now, outputs, I want to put, oh, these should be nouns, sorry. These should be nouns. And what I want to put here are things that um, are tangible, right? Or I can put measurements. Measurements are okay, too. What are some things that are outcomes or outputs from this gas, uh, from this uh, putting gas in the car? You don't have to overthink this. You can just shout it out. Receipt. Receipt. Okay. Oops, a receipt. What else? Full tank. Full tank. Got it. What else? Okay, we, I think we uh, charge, a charge, I guess, a charge. Okay, a charge. Okay, a money transfer or something like that. I think we're, I think we're okay. Let's again, let's not overthink this. With yours, how, with your processes, however, you're probably going to get lots of things. Now think about everything that sort of comes out from the back end of the process. Okay, 
if you think about going through this entire process and what comes out, um, that's, I think, the way to think about it, right? So people could say uh, uh, receipt, full tank, maybe the time, the turnaround time. Remember what I said were measurements you can also put on here if you want. So measurements mm -hmm. or, or nouns. Um, so I think we're good on that one. Um, and let's not overthink this, okay? Um, let's see. Let me. Get, this always seems to be coming up, so I am going to move that. And there we go. Okay. Um, now let's move on to uh, customers. Uh, so notice we're going from the center to the right. So customers. So this is actually very simple. A customer is anybody who receives one or more of the outputs. If they if they don't receive an output at least one, they are not a customer of this process. Okay. Um, all right. So once we have the outputs, we can write down the receipts. So uh, the customers in this case are me, right? Uh, the the person who's pumping the gas tank. Who else might be a customer here? The bank. The bank. Excellent. Who else? How about the gas station, right? Yep, the employees of the gas station. Hmm. Um, yeah, it might be the employees of the gas station. Um, might be the owner. But anyway, I think we I think we get it, right? So you want to list all the things that uh, all the people that could or uh, or uh, or are uh, recipients of this. For example, the receipt, I get the receipt, I get the full tank. Uh, the, the bank is going to get some money. The gas station is going to get some money as well. Whatever the dollars are of the transaction, I guess that's the charge. I'm going to get that. I, I feel that turnaround time, so do the employees, um, and so forth. Okay, so once we've got that, I think that's helpful. And then we can go on um, through the input side as well. Um, keep on doing that. Now, um, what's often helpful is, um, let me just kind of move those out. Again, I don't like to delete uh, my own customer's stuff here. Um, but then we can go to inputs and suppliers as well. Uh, just just a couple of different things uh, on the input side. Here are the things that you want to think about. You want to think about sort of capital equipment, like example for example pump. Right, I need the pump to pump the gas. Um, you want to think about um, uh, people. If you're in New Jersey, you need an attendant, for example. <laughs> Y'all know that if you go through New Jersey, you, you can't pump your own gas. Um, yeah, I heard that. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, you want to think about uh, 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 um, the communication line for any kind of electronic transfer. Uh, yes, you want to think. Yes, right. So you want to think about information. Thank you. Information or data. And here you've got the uh, maybe I need a credit card slot, right? or credit card reader. Um, um, so, so I'm just trying, trying to give you general categories as we go through this. People, information, um, uh, materials. So those are some general categories that you want to get, right? So I need, uh, oh, and, I, and sometimes you want to put in money as well. I need money for sure on this, right? Um, so, um, uh, or budget sometimes is a good thing to put in. So materials, I need a car. Right, so <clears throat> so there's that, and if this makes sense to everybody, which I hope it does, um, and I've just given one example. We're not trying to solve the SIPOC for this. We're just trying to give you the starting point for how you would do it, and this is something that you'd want to build with a team, um, and then a supplier. Um, just as we define customer, we're going to we're going to define the supplier similarly. A supplier is anyone who supplies one or more of the inputs. So, for example, uh, who would supply the pump? Or let, let, 
maybe it's not so. Maybe maybe we don't even have to do that. Maybe we just say, you know, let's just uh, let's just say who are the suppliers of this process? Who are some of the suppliers? The gas station itself, the owner. How about the gas station? Mm hmm. How about the oil company? Or the gas company, or whoever is the pe the petroleum, <laughs> the shell, or whatever. Right. Bank. The bank. What do they supply? They could supply a couple things, either loans or like for the credit card reader. Okay. Okay. Who else? We're missing one biggie. Who else is a customer here, or who else is a supplier? Who supplies the who supplies the car? Who supplies the credit card? Who supplies the or the money? customer? The customer, right? That's me. I'll put me. <laughs> yeah. So the interesting thing is that I'm both a customer yeah. and a supplier, and that's very very true of most transactional processes. Most transactional processes, there's a lot of information that's demanded from the customer. And by the way, at Regina, in the project that you have, you're definitely going to have. Uh, a lot of information that's coming directly from the customer. The customer's going to help themselves. What is the Jerry Maguire line? Help me help you, right? Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> is the, the real thing. You don't have to get on your knees like he did. Um, okay. Uh, once you've got this, and let's not overthink this, but um, um, uh, again, a supplier is somebody that supplies one or more of the inputs. A customer is somebody that receives one or more of the outputs. Okay. Um, once we've got all this, we can fill in uh, the rest of the blanks here, and you want maybe no more, no more than ten steps. But I like to aim for four to seven steps in this process. Okay. So if we we're going to do this, if you get to like ten or fifteen steps, you're getting too micro, and you want, might want to try grouping some of those steps. We are going to do a full process map as the time gets uh, there. But right now, we're just trying to build that relationship picture that shows w everything that's in scope all the way from the supplier to the customer. Okay, So in this case, uh, we arrive at the gas station, maybe um, um, some other things might be, uh, and I'm just going to make this up, uh, an example of this one might be uh, here. Uh, I uh, arrive at the gas station, I pull up the pump, I swipe, I pump, and I drive away. Or I pump, I pay, and drive away. Okay? And, um, you know, in this case, we've got five steps all the way through there. And, it's, and this also helps the team communicate what's the essence of the process that's going on. It's meant to be very high level, um, and it's meant to be something that puts everything together. Um, and magical things happen as you go through a SIPOC, um, and it gives you all sorts of things that you can use later um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the team. First of all, it's a great team building exercise because you as a team have now come up with what is the process? What's the start point? What's the end point? You as a team have come up with not only the outcomes, but usually you're able to prioritize these. Like, for example, this is a high priority. If we make errors here, that's not so good. This might be a high priority if we're in, in trouble if, uh, or if we're in a, a, a capacity-constrained situation. Um, and we start to understand who are the primary customers as well. Um, but on the, also, on the left-hand side, it really primes us for the things that, are, that can go wrong as well. So we can have all these things kind of go wrong uh, either in the process or we can have problems with the inputs. So lots of things happen there. Here are some other, uh, actually, before we move on, what questions or comments do you have on this? What would you recommend using the site park uh, with every project or yes, a particular single. situation? Excellent. So every single, I would say, just like it says here on, on slide, Basically, on slide four, macro map is do a SIPOC, okay? Make sure you map mm -hmm. out that relationship 
uh, uh, up front. But really, as you're going through it, just like on slide five here, it's, it can really help you link to the customer uh, and put together your key outputs, help you understand what the scope of the project is. It's a real eye-opener for an awful lot of people. And um, to a certain extent, like I said, it's the process of going through the SIPOC um, that's at least equally as important as the artifact that you create, um, the SIPOC itself. Um, um, uh, both of those things are super important, right? Because you've built that, the, the team is now ready to talk about what are the key inputs, how it relates to the customer, how it relates to the process, what are the key uh, outputs that are, I'm sorry, what are the key outputs that relate to the customer, and so forth. So it does a, a heck of a lot of things um, almost by magic. Um, so really, really helpful. And I recommend it for every project. There are some exceptions. Um, and those exceptions are things like um, when people talk about, um, oh, well, this will also give you an idea of when a project is a difficult project to run and why it might be difficult. Um, I've had some people do turn, uh, turnover projects. Hey, we want to reduce turnover in our call center. <clears throat> and it begs the question, OK, OK, what's the process by which for which turnover is an output. And that takes a lot of thought. Uh, some people might think, oh, it's the, uh, it's the, what, well, what is it? It's not the call, it's not making the calls. It's something else. It's how we handle the employees or how we manage the employees. Uh, it's that management process. Oh, okay, so that helps us define that in a different way. Um, so it can be a real eye opener to that as well. Um, here are some of the more standard things um, that it can help you. Uh, that it can help you do. Okay, it can help you identify customer. Uh, now I'm talking about on slide ten in our book. It can help you identify customers and suppliers. Um, it can help you match up this gap between the voice of the customer, what they're asking for, and what are the things that you produce. It can helps you. It can help you clarify the things that you care about and produce and the things that customers care about from what you produce. Sometimes they're not the same thing. Um, it can be used as a basis for a high-level process map. So here I've got um, a SIPOC, which is really four boxes, which aren't necessarily, some of these can even happen at the same time. They're four functions in a certain sense. Uh, it can be a basis for a high-level process map. Um, it can, this is a rather, on slide 14, this is a rather complicated picture, but it can really help you understand um, to a much higher degree uh, what you might want to measure. For example, if you're measuring overall turnaround time, cycle time, now um, having the SIPOC gives you a basis for saying, oh, okay, well, now I understand the overall cycle time, but we know we have these major steps that are happening I can measure the cycle time or the touch time between these two things. Be how long does it take me to pull the data? What's the delay between pulling the data and opening up that template? What's the, the, how long does it take for me to open up the template? What's the delay between when I open it and when I populate it, et cetera? It can also, I can also measure defects at any of these steps. I can say, how many mistakes are made when I pull the, the data? How many mistakes are made when I open the template? How many mistakes are made when I populate, et cetera. Okay, so it's really helpful for understanding sort of where your measurements are going to happen. Nice tool to look back and say, hmm, what should we measure? Where should we measure it? Okay, and it's also an excellent thing to show to people to say, here's where we're going to drill down. Uh, it may come up, and Steve, you asked a great question because it may come up that certain things uh, are where the problem is. Like you, you may uh, have this as your P in the SIPOC, but later find out this is where all the is this is where all the issues are. If you're, I don't know, measuring the cycle time to produce a, a to produce a report, which is what this is, you may find that this is where all the cycle time is happening. Now this becomes a basis for our SIPOC that we can now drill down into. So we could make a SIPOC out of this. Um, so sometimes that's helpful to do that as well. Sometimes it's not necessary, but sometimes it's helpful to do, um, just understand sort of, okay, now if we're only going to have this in scope, 
what are the inputs that are coming from all these, what are the outputs, and who are the customers. Maybe they're not the same people. Okay, so I'm going to stop here um, because we've reached the end of this, but um, I want to ask you before we go on, what questions do you have about the SIPOC? Uh, what other questions? Steve asked a great one. Uh, what other questions do you have about the SIPOC? Tammy, I have a question. Sure. Um, and I apologize because I have a cold, so I, I'm sorry if it, I'm not sounding the best. But um, <clears throat> if on the side pocket, you always want to use what you want to achieve, right? Not what the process is now. It's everything on what you're hoping to achieve, right? Oh my gosh, that's such a great question. The answer to that is no. You should be doing the as is oh. process. Okay, it's what we do today, what we currently do today. Okay. In a design project, you still also, by the way, do a SIPOC. A SIPOC is great for a design project, and uh, then it would be what you want what you want the thing to look like. But right now, we want to do what what the as is process. So thank you for bringing that up. Today, we want to do the as is. Up until we uh, actually up until we're really in the the late analysis phase, we want to be looking at the as is process. Great. Thank you. You bet. What other questions do you have? That was a, that was another excellent one. Okay, well, um, I'm going to give you a minute to write down in your view what are the key takeaways of this section, what are the questions that you can answer as a result of this, and how you can support business improvement with what we covered. This is your time to write down what's important to you about what we just covered. SIPOC, one of my favorite tools, and uh, definitely a must, uh, a must do. As you're thinking about that, I also want to point out that sometimes, even though this is a great tool for a team, it's not always necessarily the greatest tool to put in the presentation um, because it can be very complex. When somebody looks at it for the first time and they don't know what they're looking at, it can be kind of complex. Um, so if you do put it in a presentation, you might want to think about simplifying it greatly. Okay, well we are going to move on to something that is not covered in many Six Sigma, uh, Six Sigma classes. We're going to cover something called DCOM. Um, and this is the first in, uh, in <laughs> I guess, in an installment of, of things that we're going to talk about and have you discuss um, in separate readings. Um, and we'll also bring it into class, into the lectures um, a couple of different times throughout. This is one of those times. Uh, and it's all about behavior. Here we're going to be talking about the behavioral aspect of Six Sigma. Um, obviously, um, in or one of the things that we talked about the last time was DMAIC, right? The MAIC. Um, the C stands for control, but really we want to think about um, how sticky are the changes that we're going to make. And that involves, as Dan and others said last time, very important thing to get right, and that's the change management. Um, so this is kind of a, uh, um, behaviors come into play very strongly in that. If you can make all the process changes you want, make it be perfect and wonderful, if you design a process such that it's going to punish the people who are processing it or who are acting out in that process, it probably isn't going to work. And when I say probably, I mean almost assuredly it won't work. Uh, so DCOM is uh, one of the first steps in that. It was developed by a, a friend of mine who uh, was an early mentor of mine who unfortunately has since passed away uh, by the name of Jim Hilgren. And uh, what he did was he was at a company called Chevron. He was a consultant there. And Chevron asked him to look into um, what made, um, from a behavioral perspective, what were the things that made uh, uh, top quartile oil companies? 
he went out and he did a study of all comp or of a broad swath of companies, so it, it applied to more than just the oil companies, and he found <clears throat> that um, um, that the top quartile companies were all doing these things well, and DCOM, unlike Demaic, is actually a very uh, I think straightforward um, acronym, and I think you'll find it's uh, it's um, I think you'll find that it's uh, that it's pretty clear. Um, Let's see. So um, let me just let's just go into it. Um, here's where you can use. Here, here's where I'm going to suggest that in a Six Sigma project you can use DCOM. You can use it to help you make the business case, and you can use it at all the toll gate approvals um, to do a, a weather check for your team to see if the team is on the right is in the right place. Um, okay, and I'm just going to throw that out. It's usually used as a strategic directional sort of thing, um, similar to like. Uh, Oh, um, Jim Collins' model, good to great, or, or some other thing like that. Um, so I'm going to take you through it, and I'm going to give you a, a but, but think about, you know, you could use it on your team by essentially polling your team to say, how are we doing on these various aspects? I think you'll get it right away, so uh, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, belabor the point. The key in all of this is that, um, I, I don't think this is controversial at all, but uh, behavior is really a key driver of performance. You can have a great business system, you can have everything great, but if your people don't follow through on the behaviors that are um, conducive to getting great results, you're not going to get great results. Um, uh, many companies, I, I don't know if most, I don't know if that's correct anymore, but certainly many companies focus uh, <clears throat> when they manage on results only. We already talked about how that's process is one of those ways of looking at how you get the results. It's a key thing in Demaic, uh to search for that cause and effect, to understand why we get results. Behaviors are one of those uh, places where we look. Um, okay, so um, and I don't even want to go on to uh, <clears throat> why we need to do this. Um, okay, so first thing to do is to think about um, there's behaviors, there's metrics, and there's sort of states of being um, if we're looking at this. And sometimes people get them wrong. Um, so instead of just asking you guys, I think I'm just going to kind of walk uh, as we go through it. Um, if we think about metrics, metrics, uh, behaviors, or I don't know, I guess I'll say states, Whatever that means, <coughs> states of being. Uh, what would each, what would any of these fall into? So, uh, customer satisfaction score. That's not really a behavior, is it? It's a metric, right? Did we all agree mm -hmm. with that? That's a metric. How about developing a new product? Is that a behavior, a metric, or a state? Behavior. State. That's a behavior. It's a behavior because I can look and I can see if somebody is developing a new product, I can watch them doing it, right? I can I can actually take my clipboard out there and say yes or no, they're doing it or not. Now it may not I may have to have additional definitions about what that is. How about this one? Dedicated nurse. Metric behavior state. Non behavior. Behavior. Hmm. Can I see somebody dedicated nursing? <laughs> I guess the point is I can say, hey, that person is a dedicated nurse, so I could turn that into a metric, but it's not really a behavior. I can't watch, I can't watch somebody be dedicated nurse. I can, watch, I, can, I can define what that is, but I can't, I can't watch somebody dedicated nurse, if that makes any sense. This is going to be a key here, by the way, <laughs> that Jiren. Sales volume, that's a metric, right? Summarizing account receivable, that actually is a behavior, right? Because I can watch somebody doing that. Good vendor relations, that is a state. I either have it or I don't, right? This is also a state of being. Bad attitude, that's a state. I can put up different things that say these behaviors represent a bad attitude, but I need to do some more work to get to the point where I can measure that. Conducting telephone calls, that's a behavior. Uh, value of non-gasket, well, goodness, that's a metric. It's a complicated one. Invoicing a patient, that's a behavior. Right? I can watch somebody doing that. And the key is usually 
this right here, that ing. When I see an ing, those are behaviors. Again, I don't want to be belabor this, but um, it's just something that it, we should get used to. If we can see it happening, then we can put a measure on it. Uh, then it's a behavior, and we can put a measure on it. We can say if somebody's doing it or not, in theory. Um, okay. So uh, now that we've gone through that, let me go over this DCOM model, and then I think we'll uh, we'll call it a day. Uh, I guess I'll move. I'll, uh, I'll I'll stop and I'll say, what questions do you have on this? Um, are we comfortable with this? Okay. I assume that's okay. Um, um, so here's basically what the DCOM model is. Okay. The DCOM model is an attribute for uh, uh, for large scale, does a company have these different things? Does it have direction or a team? It could be applied to a company, a team, or it could even be include, uh, to an individual, although it's not usually. Usually you're talking about a company or a team. So uh, it was originally applied to a company and asked, you know, does the company have direction? Do they have a consistency of purpose? Um, do they have uh, metrics that are um, that are customer directed um, and match that purpose. The second thing is, do they have competence? Do we have the right people and do the pe those people have the right skills to be able to do this? Um, there's one other aspect in here that I want to just mention um, when we get to talk about it directly. Um, third thing is, do we have the opportunities? And this usually refers to um, do we have the authority? This is another. Do the right people have the authority um, to do what they need to do? And then finally, do we have the right motivations in place? Do uh, do our folks really? Um, do we want to do what we have to do? Um, is this motivating to us? Okay. So if we think about a. Um, um, so if we think about a, a Six Sigma team, all of these things I think should make a lot of sense, right? Do we have direction? Now think about this. Do we have direction? Are we solving the right problem? Do we have, the, uh, do we have competence? Do we have the right people on the team? Do we have the SMEs, the subject matter experts who are going to help us get to the root causes? Do we have good project management? Do we have a black belt that can execute? Um, um, do we understand how, um, and uh, I didn't say this under direction, but do we understand how what we're uh, solving this problem also helps our business, right? What's the economic value of solving this problem? Um, do we have the opportunity? Um, is this a team that when we come up with solutions, they're going to let us do the, uh, try the solutions out? Do we have authority to make these changes? And then finally, do, are we motivated to do this? Is this doing the right thing? Uh, is it something that we want to do uh, for the business? Is it something that we find personally motivating? Um, and so forth. Again, I, I think that all of these are pretty straightforward um, uh, and uh, all make sense in the real world. Um, so, um, you know, we can go through all of these different things, like under direction, we, do we have a consistent va a vision? Do we have consistent values that support that vision? Do we have measures? But uh, I think you kind of most people kind of get this uh, viscerally, uh, what's going on. Uh, but again, I'll let you look through these different things. Um, competence can be uh, not just technical skills, but it can be management skills, it can be interpersonal skills. And I mentioned this last thing, this economic literacy. Do we know how what I do? I know how what I do affects the company's uh, financial performance. Um, Opportunities, and this is this is uh, this is one of those things that's very much related to. In the in the first lecture, we talked about how everybody talks about data making data <coughs> driven decisions. Um, those are only effective if the people who really know and understand those decisions um, can act those out, can actually make those decisions, have the authority. People talk about empowerment. That's what we're really. I think that's what we really are talking about when. We're talking about an empowered company. It's somebody who has the authority to make decisions at the appropriate uh, for their appropriate level of expertise and, and responsibility. Um, all right, and motivation. I, again, I think we we already get that. And here's a, just a summary of what all those things are. 
And I think this is sometimes helpful if we talk about a team uh, who has uh, uh, direction, has direction, has competence, has opportunity, but no motivation. We might call the team sluggish. Uh, if we talk about a team that is, uh, has direction and competence, but no opportunity, and they are motivated, we call them discouraged, right? That can be very discouraging. Um, if we have a team that is uh, competent, but is not, uh, has no direction, uh, no opportunity, no motivation, call them ineffectual. And we talk about a company that is, uh, it has competence, opportunity, and motivation, but no direction, we talk about them as confused. Um, <laughs> so all of those things can help. Um, um, I, I'm going to suggest, since we've hit sort of the top of the hour, that we leave this for next time, realizing that we're probably a, a half hour to 45 minutes back. Um, that's okay. I think we can make most of that up on, on Friday, if not all of that. Um, and um, um, I, I, think we can, I think we can leave it there. But I'm going to leave you with this thought, and that is just understanding this DCOM model. Um, can you see how... Um, can you see how, if you're a sponsor, somebody had asked about the questions that you can ask. If you're a sponsor, uh, or if you're, better yet, if you're a black belt and you're running a team, how at certain checkpoints you can poll the team or you can poll people and say, score yourself. Uh, let's score our team on a one to five scale or something like that. Do we understand, do we have direction? Do we have, you know, do we have the right competencies on this team? Do we, feel, do we still feel comfortable that we have the opportunity? And uh, do we feel that our business case is sufficiently motivating um, to get this stuff done? And uh, if you do it uh, anonymously, uh, you can actually really find some of those gaps. Um, so it's a helpful thing to kind of do a weather check, I find, at the end of each of these stages. And it can be done very quickly, very quickly. So we'll come back and we'll do this uh, exercise um, next time. Um, but uh, for now, I think we're going to say, uh, I think we're going to sign off. And uh, I will leave uh, the phone line open. Um, and uh, I did want to also say um, that for next time, since we are going to be talking about data collection, actually it works out perfectly. Since we're going to be talking about data collection, um, remember I had sent, um, I sent all of you an email, and I'll just go over that very quickly. Um, I think some of you saw the beginning of it. Um, you saw the beginning of, uh, of this. Um, I sent you an email with a, um, with a New York Times uh, article in it uh, called, Can This Treatment Help Me? There's a statistic for that, and uh, what I'd like you to do, it's, it's a short article, uh, it won't take that long to read it, um, and uh, it's talking about medical treatments and um, the efficacy of these medical treatments, and I'd like you to read it so we can discuss it a little bit on Friday. Um, shouldn't take more than five minutes to read, and I think you'll find it, uh, I think you'll find it interesting, and, and uh, let's discuss it on Friday. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave the phone line open if you have any questions. So I'm going to stay on for a bit, but I am going to uh, I'm going to end the uh, recording now, and we'll uh, we'll say uh, we'll say uh, we'll see you later. Okay, so if you have questions, stay on the line. But uh, if you don't, we'll see you on Friday. If you have any questions, feel free to call me in the meantime. Okay, take care. Have a great night.